Speaking of Timmins is proud to present our 2014 Candidates for Council interview series. Well, welcome everyone. My guest today is candidate for Ward 5 in the upcoming municipal election, uh, Noella Ronaldo. Noella, welcome to Speaking of Timmins. Hi, Frank. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, perhaps some of the highlights of your uh, four years on council? Well, you know what? There isn't one particular thing that stands out in the last four years on council. I mean, I was a councillor for Ward uh, 3, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, there was a lot of accomplishments that I think added up. Um, we had everything from the strategic plan. We had uh, a lot of new businesses open up, such as the hotels and um, it was just a great experience altogether. I mean, I was very lucky to sit on certain boards, one of them being um, non-profit, DSAB, and the Golden Manor. So the opening of Extendicare really was a complement to that. That was something that was very favorable for the city. I think it was a combination of quite a few things. I mean, and you have those little accomplishments. Um, I was very lucky. I, I really advocate for bringing back the statues to um, Schumacher and bringing Sandy McIntyre back there. We were able to open the museum in that short time, and I sit on the museum board. Opening the museum and having the Hollinger House and the Prospector's Cabin brought back, I mean, those are some small accomplishments, but they mean a lot to people in the quality of life. And, I mean, the strategic plan was such a big project. It really enveloped all those years uh, of sitting on council, and I'm hoping it made a, a nice plan for the future for everyone. What do you believe should be the top two or three priorities for the new council? Well, I mean, cash has always comes up, but I think what, we, what it is is you kind of have to look at the big picture. Is, um, people are always never going to be happy with their taxes. They're never going to be low, no, low enough for anyone. I mean, I'm, I'm a taxpayer. But you have to realize that it's who it's affecting, um, whether it's seniors, whether it's, it's young people. We have to look at that middle range. The assessment is a big thing. And so when you have young people buying their first home, of course, their assessments are going to be high because they're buying new houses and they're going to be assessed properly. And when you have seniors in their homes that have been there for 20, 30 years, every little raise of the increase, tax increase, really comes back to them and they really feel it in their budget. But we have to understand that the mid-range is where we're getting, we're not assessed properly. And we have, you know, such a number of people that are paying below their assessment. And so that it really is that adjustment of the assessment uh, to kind of affects the taxes. And I think that whole big picture of the taxes, I mean, we, we've been very diligent in, in the taxes, and I think we have to continue that. And I'm hoping the communication to the public gets a little better. I mean, we have this ratepayer association that's starting up. I think that's a great thing because anything that educates the public on how these different um, boards and committees that we are responsible for, how the city is run, anything that educates the public on those decisions is a great thing. I mean, we sit in council for three months almost, um, three weeks, three days a week at the minimum uh, during budget time. And it's important, you know, we get the news, we get the media there the first couple of days and then we kind of lose them a little bit at a time. And it's important that the public understand that that process is a long process and that one night that they don't watch, something important could be happening in their opinion, which could mean a lot in that decision. Um, you know, there's some long kind of boring nights that we that we need to go through those procedures to see if uh, we're doing our due diligence properly but there are some nights that are quite contemptuous and I'm, I wish something something like this ratepayers association if they come every night and make sure they have a representative a night and if there's something that they're not happy with they bring that back to the public I think that's a good thing I think that education process is very important the second thing would be definitely communication with the public um, as a counselor, as a new counselor, I was frustrated with the procedures of how certain things happen. And I think that's important. It's the day-to-day -day living that people get frustrated about when it comes to the to City Hall. And it's whether their water lines are frozen, whether their garbage didn't get picked up, whether they, um, you know, they have a, a neighbor that's built a garage on their, their property. It doesn't really matter. There's no really um, procedure that people go through. What they do now is they phone their counselor. And it's up to the counselor to phone the proper people in, in the right department, but then there's no procedure to see if they were followed up on or if um, they were if the problem was dealt with properly. And usually by the time the other counselors uh, hear about it, it's usually when it's blown up into a bigger problem. And I think we have to have a system that the public can say, 
this is what's happening, and if it, we can at least see that it's been dealt with and there's some accountability, because right now there's no accountability that it was dealt with, and it falls back to the um, to the counselors. And that was the one frustrating thing is that, you know, I get a phone call, I try to follow up on it, but then you were constantly checking on it week after week to see if it was done. And it shouldn't be like that. There should be a system in place. I know um, both the candidates running, two of the candidates running for mayor have mentioned more um, perhaps open community meetings. And I think that's a place where we can take those concerns and as a whole go back to, to a department head and say, can we deal with this, whether it be bylaw or public works, whatever it is. We can bring it back instead as an individual, we bring it back as a council and say, look, there's a definite problem here with uh, let's take garbage pickup for an example. In this particular area, why is that? We can get both the explanation and how they're going to deal with it. And I think that was very frustrating for me as a counselor the last four years. And those are the things that irritate the public. It's those little everyday things like that that they really uh, want to make sure there's some type of clarity there. It might be a little thing to somebody, but to a homeowner, it can be that that's a big thing to them, and and, and it should be dealt with. If elected, what priority would you like to see addressed in Ward 5 specifically? You know what? I, I don't really think there's anything that's specific to Ward 5 um, that is a problem. In the last four years, the good majority of the work that we've dealt with is, is citywide, whether it be the strategic plan, taxes, water sewer treatment plan. Everything we've been dealing with um, has been citywide. There wasn't anything specific to um, Ward 5 or Ward 3, for example. So I, I don't really think there's anything I can signal out. I mean, roads are bad in all the wards. Um, your infrastructure is a big issue uh, with everyone. So I think uh, right now some of the problems that we have, we have to look at those big issues such as infrastructure. And um, that's not specific to any one ward. Many candidates and taxpayers in this campaign have spoken about this being an election of change. What changes would you like to see on council and at City Hall? Well, I think, like I said, the communication part of it with the public and to come back to council so we know there's some accountability there um, with there's different departments that the public has to deal with. I think that's a really important one because uh, it is one that I dealt with um, almost every night. It, you know, I, I would ask, leave the messages on my cell phone and deal with them when I got home at night. And honestly, there wasn't a night I don't think that I wasn't talking to a constituent about a problem. And they weren't all from my ward either. They came from all over because I have lived across the city um, in my life. I, I've lived 15 years in Ward 5 and 15 year, years out in Porcupine and South Porcupine. And then I've moved back to Schumacher for eight years. So I've lived across the city and, and a lot of people know me. So I got all those calls and those emails at night. So I dealt with them. So I think there has to be a better way to, to deal with them. Um, I think that's definitely one of them. And we really have to look as a, as a council, we really have to look at the infrastructure and how we're going to deal with the roads in the future. Um, you know, I, I come to work every day and I see those trucks on the road and, you know, we have to look at some way of perhaps uh, these big trucks that are hauling ore or hauling wood or wherever they're going, maybe we have to look at some kind of a tolling system or something. You know, if Air Canada can charge us $25 for an extra suitcase, we should be able to find some mechanism in place that we can charge these vehicles 25 50 bucks for every load because they are the ones that are really putting a lot of stress on our roads and we just can't, as a city, afford them anymore. We know coming up it's going to be a tough battle in the next couple of years, and uh, we know how bad the roads are getting. Ward 5 includes a downtown core, and many business people operating in that part of town are wondering what the new council will try to do to increase the amount of traffic in the downtown core. Well, you know what? I think one of the misconceptions of the downtown is that it's not full. It is full. It's full with service industry. That's the problem. It's not full with retail. But I do think a lot of our buildings are tired. We've been very lucky. We've gone through a bit of a, a stage right now where we're doing a lot of the infrastructure work underneath. Um, Hydro vaults, for example, the Spruce Street got redone. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, that was done simply because we had to. I mean, the water pipes burst there. And, and we have enough foresight to think, well, if we have to fix the infrastructure underneath, we may as well, you know, we have to repave the road. The hydro vaults is a huge project. It's a five to six million dollar project that uh, my work in the city, I mean, we, we hounded hydro to get that work done. That really lent to the future of uh, the downtown being sustainable. It's having a, a power grid that we could rely on. But we do, I mean, there are things like this uh, SIP program, which is the community improvement there that we've had in the past few years. 
And that really, I think if it was, and, and it doesn't have to be the downtown, I think it should be, and I've mentioned this and I have spoke very, very loudly on this, that I think the SIP program is a great program, which is a 50-50 match with the business and the city on, a, on the outside of improvement of a business. But I think we have to focus on one particular area. I don't care if it's Algonquin in front of City Hall. I don't care if it's coming through Schumacher or if it's right in the downtown somewhere because you need to see the impact. I mean, I dealt with this in North Bay, saw the impact almost immediately um, because they kept it in smaller areas. We tend to keep it in a bigger area, so you don't see the impact. You may have five or six businesses that can take advantage of the, of the facade grant, but they're really spread out. If you limit it to a smaller area, you'll see a dramatic increase immediately. And I think that's an important, uh, that's a very tried and proven uh, method is the SIP program. Um, I think economic development does a good job of attracting new businesses, and I know we're always working on new business. I mean, the space agency was a huge, that's a huge benefit to the uh, city, the balloon launch. That brings, you know, I, I think people would be shocked at how many people work here full-time. It's over 100 people work in the city full-time with that balloon launch, and then that balloon, obviously, when um, a balloon is actually launched. And that was a really innovative way of bringing new businesses into the city, and I think that's important. As far as the downtown core, I think it's on that revitalization. It's starting that, that whole system with the groundwork being laid down. Um, but I, I think we do need to have some work with the facades. And we're going through that growth spurt, too, with uh, our second and third floor, re floor revitalization. So those are turning more and more into apartments, which is the way that they're showing retail on the bottom and uh, apartments on second and third floors. It start, starts to bring the public into the downtown core, and you are seeing that happen. It's a slow process, though. I won't uh, I'll admit it isn't something that happens overnight. But the perception is that... Um, there's some empty buildings. We have three empty buildings that just became empty, and uh, one of them is already spoken for. The buildings are filled. The only thing is they're filled with service industries, not retail, and the public's perception is they should be retail. Now it's time for our rapid-fire questions, where we get to know the candidates a little better outside of their political opinions. What three living individuals that you have never met would you like to go out for dinner with? Um, I think the new Pope. Uh, very innovative in his thought process. Um, the new Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, the young 15-year-old, I cannot pronounce her name, Kyla. Um, and I would have to say Michelle Obama. What book should every person read in their lifetime? I have a hard time because I have two favorite books. And the reason they're favorite books is because they were given to me when I was young by a teacher in grade 7 or 8. And one was Farley Mowat. Uh, Never Cry Wolf, and I love Farley Mowat, and another one was Thor Hydra with the, the Contiki. Two very strange books when you think of them, but they were books that really captured me at that age, and they really helped me read. Like, they really kind of promoted that love of reading, and both those books, if you were to ask me, the first books I wrote, I read, those are the ones, uh, you know, and Farley Mowat really just opened up a whole new world of, of books. I, I'm not sure why those particular books, why he had us read them. I think obviously he he had a, a love of um, perhaps uh, the, the wilderness and, and you know, th that kind of thing. But those two books always stuck in my mind, and they really kind of helped promote me into living. They, they stuck me in. What has been your favorite travel destination? Anywhere warm. I can't really pick one, but anywhere warm. What one or two items would people be surprised to see on your bucket list? Um, geez, you know what? One or two of, the, two of them that I'd done on my bucket list, actually, that were on there that I think people were surprised. I always wanted to see the Rose Bowl Parade. And I also also wanted to see Neil Diamond. I'm very fortunate that I was able to do both of them in a matter of two days. I got to see the Rose Bowl Parade in, in Anaheim and I in Pasadena, California, and I also got to see Neil Diamond two nights later. So, I mean, two of things on my bucket list, which were kind of strange, uh, were, I've been very lucky and I've been able to do them, so. And that concludes this episode of the 2014 Candidates for Council interview series presented by Speaking of Timmons.